What we know now is that by 2050, almost 50% of the world or close to 5 billion people will be MARPIC and almost 1 billion people will be highly MARPIC and at risk of vision impairment and blindness. Hello from Canberra, the capital of Australia. I am Dr. Monica Jong, the Executive Director of the International Myopia Institute. It's an honour to speak today at the Cake and Pie Expo at the Orbis Symposium on Myopia. Myopia is one of the biggest threats to public health in the 21st century, and it presents both a challenge and an opportunity for all eye care practitioners and the industry to unite and make a huge difference to patients. Today, 1 billion people have avoidable vision impairment, mostly located in Asia and Africa. Distance uncorrected refractive error is the number one cause of moderate and severe vision impairment, of which myopia is the main cause. And this is set to rise in future with the increasing prevalence of myopia globally. People are pushed into poverty because they cannot work and cannot be educated because they cannot see properly, simply because they don't have correct spectacles or they can't afford it. Some of the work that we've been doing in the past at BHVI includes addressing uncorrected refractive error in places such as Vietnam, where it's the second highest cause of vision impairment. In 2008, there were only two optometrists serving the 90 million population. So what we did was support the establishment of two optometry schools in collaboration with ophthalmology in Vietnam. And this has led to graduates today working in collaboration to address uncorrected refractive error and myopia. One of the most critical pieces of work that was published um, by our team and myself at BHVI was the global prevalence of myopia from 2000 to 2050. Before this, there was not a single global number to show the size of the problem of myopia. What we know now is that by 2050, almost 50% of the world or close to 5 billion people will be MARPIC and almost 1 billion people will be highly MARPIC and at risk of vision impairment and blindness. To meet these needs in future will require all of us to provide comprehensive eye examinations, refraction and surgery. If we look at the world more closely by 2050, most parts of the world will have a prevalence of myopia of over 50%. In East Asia, you can see it's all red, and that's because myopia is pretty much affecting from 65% to close to 80% of the East Asian population. Uh, in Japan and Singapore, we can see that the prevalences are reaching close to 80%. Already today in South Korea, 96% of male military conscripts are myopic, and almost 90% of medical students in China and Japan have myopia. Myopia has serious consequences, and that's why it matters. If we look at this table, you can see that Every adopter of myopia increases the risk of things such as cataract, glaucoma, retinal detachment, and myopic macular degeneration. And when you hit the higher levels of myopia, the risks increase exponentially. We also know today that axial lengths over 30 millimeters in older, highly myopic people can increase vision impairment risk to 90%. Today, myopic macular degeneration is a leading cause of permanent blindness in parts of Asia and Europe. And our work showed that by 2050, there will be about 56 million people vision impaired and 20 million blind from myopic macular degeneration. Economically, myopia poses a huge challenge in both the developing and developed world. The global cost of lost productivity from uncorrected myopia and myopic macular degeneration alone was estimated to be 250 billion US dollars in 2015, and this is only set to rise. So it really does make economic sense to prevent and slow myopia progression. And some of the work we're doing now is uh, looking at the cost benefit of myopia management. In 2015, myopia and high myopia was officially recognised as a public health issue by the WHO. This was a landmark moment and it was a long journey to get there, which involved Professor Holden, myself and the team at BHVI advocating to the Australian government, which then led to uh, the government inviting WHO to Sydney to lead the WHO BHVI meeting on myopia. 34 WHO regions were represented by the leaders of ophthalmology and optometry. Two members from the WHO head office in Geneva also came along and we published the first report on myopia and homopia, which told us that there was evidence to suggest 
preventing myopia and slowing its progression. But unfortunately, practitioner concern in most parts of the world is still very low for myopia. And the highest level of concern was in Asia where 9% of practitioners said they were concerned. And that's why we're doing a further study working with the AAC and our ophthalmology collaborators to conduct a study to further understand the reasons why the awareness and concern isn't so high and what we need to do to improve myopia management and education in this region. Because myopia is such a serious problem in Asia, people are really desperate to do something and they don't know what the evidence is. And so people are resorting to um, actions or treatments that may not have much supporting evidence at all. And we as practitioners need to unite and help to educate the public. And so following the WHO meeting, the International Myopia Institute was founded as a working group to continue ringing the alarm bell about myopia and to bring together all the experts to investigate, understand and collect the evidence and bring consensus to the different areas of myopia management and make these resources available freely around the world in all the global languages. And so that we can educate and advocate to practitioners, researchers, governments and policymakers and society about the importance of myopia. We're a global team based out of Sydney and the IMI is chaired by Professor Serge Reznikov, who's the former head of the WHO Deafness and Blindness Prevention Department. And our chief scientist is Professor James Wolfson from Aston University. And you can see that our board and committee members include the leading experts in myopia, refractive error from ophthalmology and optometry, and many of whom are from the Asia Pacific region. Today, we have 14 task forces, 138 task force members, and over 1,600 general members. Our 138 task force members all contributed to the IMI white papers that were published in 2019 in these topics and 2021 recently. And some of these findings I'll present today. Today, there is evidence to prevent and slow myopia. So we have a number of optical interventions. So all the optical interventions are thought to work by providing myopic defocus. In other words, bringing the retinal image onto the retina or in front of the retina and bringing the image in front of the retina uh, slows eye growth. For spectacle treatments, under correction is not recommended. And that's because there are reports of faster progression and we don't want to have that risk. The best spectacle uh, options for slowing myopia progression today include the executive bifocals, the DIMS lens and the HAL lens. And they provide between uh, 50 to about 67 percent on average slowing of myopia progression. And it really depends on how many hours they are worn for. So if you wear them longer from waking to before bed, then you're going to have more uh, slowing of myopia progression. Then we also have uh, the contact lenses, which are available too. Standard RGPs do not slow myopia progression. There are a whole number of soft multifocal contact lens designs available on the market today, which may be off-label, and they have been shown to clinically slow myopia progression. And there is one FDA-approved um, contact lens, the MySight, it's a daily disposable lens, and that's also able to slow myopia effectively. So on average, the soft multifocal contact lenses provide about 38% slowing, but some of them can provide ranges of up to 90%. The MySight provides on average 59% slowing, so it's a very good treatment option. Orthokeratology is also a very effective um, a treatment for myopia progression, to slow myopia progression. It on average provides about 50% slowing and can give a range of about 30 to 60%. But because they're worn overnight, we do have to be careful of uh, the risk of microbial keratitis in our patients. Low dose atropine, 0.01%, is currently used in many parts of the world, particularly in Asia, due to it having little or no adverse effects. The higher concentrations of atropine, such as 1%, slow myopia progression much more. Um, effectively, but they tend to lead to intolerable adverse effects such as pupil dilation and accommodation loss. And when 1% is stopped, you get a significant rebound effect or catch up in your myopia progression. Recent work in the LAMP Hong Kong study has suggested that clinicians could validly use 0.025% and 0.05% low-dose atropine. And because these are slightly higher 
low dose concentrations provide better slowing of the axial elongation with very few adverse effects. In the pharmacological area, uh, new drugs are also being trialled today, such as caffeine eye drops and dopamine eye drops, which you can read more about um, in the yearly digest we've published. There is also early evidence uh, emerging that combination therapy, um, such as adding low-dose atropine to ortho K treatment, has been able to enhance the slowing um, of myopia progression by almost 30%. As general advice, we should be advising at least 120 minutes daily outdoors time, reducing near work, and always aiming to provide a clear retinal image. There are some really exciting things happening in the future, and this includes recent studies that have published centile curves for axial length to estimate the risk of myopia and high myopia in European and Chinese children. We measure axial lengths uh, in clinical trials, and this additional information can be very helpful in patient management clinically. In future, this may become part of the standard of care because it's non-invasive and objective. And for treatments that, you know, there's no refractive change, such as ortho-K, monitoring axial length can be a much more um, simpler way than washing out the ortho-K treatment. There are also smart devices which are being trialed because the role of lifestyle is critical in myopia management. And these smart devices can monitor uh, light levels, light exposure, as well as uh, near work. If you want additional information, there are a lot of online resources available today that you can use to help you communicate with your patients, such as Myopia Profile. You can monitor your patients' um, uh, interventions with uh, Myopia Control using the Myopia Calculator and further learn more about Myopia Management using online courses that you can see on this slide. We have free International Myopia Institute white papers and clinical summaries on our website in many international languages. And we send out e-blasts periodically, so feel free to sign up. All of us can help to create awareness about myopia by speaking to the parent and child. We know today there are evidence-based options for preventing and slowing myopia progression. And it's important that we manage myopia given that there are serious risks to vision with increasing myopia. What you do in your practice depends on the patient lifestyle and needs, as well as what the parent's um, wishes are. And you need to combine this with what is available in your region. And there is something available everywhere because as you can see from the interventions I listed, um, you can choose contact lens or spectacle options as well as low dose atropine. As with any type of uh, treatment, careful monitoring of patients is needed. So let's all join the call to action in preventing future vision impairment and blindness in myopia by working together. Thank you so much for your time.